No president should fear public scrutiny of his program. For from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. Welcome back, ladies, gentlemen, and crypto degenerates to Blackstone Special Feature. In my attempt to further the crypto ecosystem and provide some generally useful content for viewers, I thought some research-heavy subjects might be of value, both for those who have been in crypto for years and those who are fresh to the industry. The thing is, there's simply not enough infrastructure laid out yet. Though Bitcoin and crypto are 10 years old now, there's still not enough of the kind of content that I'm talking about. Less money talk and price speculation, and more entertaining investigative journalism, if you can call it that. And so here we are. Due to the infancy of crypto, there are many topics that are seemingly left alone, like a dimly lit alley or an old back street, where mysteries are sometimes stumbled upon by the rare visitor, but then left, discarded, forgotten. And so it is that we turn our attention to the subject of the very first Blackstone special feature. Today we're going to go over one of the most interesting, controversial, enigmatic, and dangerous figures in crypto. We're going to try and unravel a story that is as complex as it is elusive. We're going to try to look at the web of connections of one of Bitcoin's earliest proponents, who would later turn out to be one of its biggest enemies. I'm speaking, of course, of Craig Stephen Wright. Before we really get into the beat of things, it's important that I give a disclaimer. My name and face are out there, and we all know certain individuals who wouldn't hesitate from making a lawsuit or otherwise try and attack me for exactly this kind of content. So Craig, Calvin, and others, if you're watching this, allow me to put you at ease. We won't be making any silly assumptions here like calling fraud or other slanderous accusations. No, in this video we will merely stick to the facts, what we know from the evidence, verified statements, and proof, and allowing the viewer to come to their own conclusions. For viewers unaware as to the whole situation, allow me to give you a quick rundown to catch you up. The Bitcoin white paper was published in October 2008 on a cryptography mailing list by an anonymous user going by the handle of Satoshi Nakamoto. What started as an inconspicuous white paper and vaguely defined design spec would quickly grow, gathering computer power and processing resources from computers in dimly lit rooms around the world. Bitcoin was a fragile baby, but alive. Its mathematical heart was beating and its hash power would only grow from its inception. The idea worked, the cat was out of the bag, and the world had been irrevocably changed. It just didn't know it yet. Bitcoin would later go on to be worth thousands, millions, and then billions in market cap, equaling the size of some Fortune 500 companies and making its early holders unimaginably wealthy. Which leads us back to Satoshi Nakamoto. After a few years of interacting with the community on the Bitcoin Talk forums, he mysteriously vanished, saying that he had moved on to other things. One can only imagine exactly what other marvelous ideas Bitcoin's creator was planning on working on next. Perhaps we'll never know. Time will tell. But the question remains, just who exactly was Satoshi Nakamoto? Who was this enigmatic figure who created one of the world's most unique inventions? Why did he vanish? And would he ever do anything with those early mined Bitcoin nicknamed the Satoshi wallets? Well, as it turns out, claiming you're the creator of one of history's greatest financial assets and the father of a financial revolution comes with a lot of benefits. So naturally, there have been lots of people who have stepped forward and laid claim to the title of Bitcoin's creator, as well as people that others have claimed to be Satoshi, like Elon Musk and this old guy who you might be familiar with named Dorian Nakamoto. The mystery behind the infamous Satoshi has remained a mystery, however, and hard evidence has never really come out. You know, the kind of evidence that is really easy to provide if you are actually Satoshi, like sending, say, Bitcoins from your wallet or signing a message. Hell, even using Satoshi's old PGP key would go a long way toward verifying your claim to the digital throne. And so we come finally back full circle to the tale of Craig Stephen Wright, the de facto leader of Bitcoin Satoshi's vision and a man who has been claiming he is Satoshi himself for years. Craig Stephen Wright is an Australian computer scientist and entrepreneur. In his first ever reveal to the world, he said that he does a little bit of everything, and that's definitely a good way of putting it. He has a huge stack of patents, although I will add a small caveat here that um, a lot of them aren't particularly novel, a bunch of degrees in various fields like law and computer science, and is generally an all-around pretty intelligent guy. Hilariously, there's a video of Craig bringing a wheelbarrow on stage at a public event where he goes through a number of his accolades, rewards, degrees, and so on. Pretty hilarious stuff, and the kind of narcissistic charisma that you could only come to expect from a self-claimed genius. He's worked for ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange, was working on the world's first online casino, and was even part of some cypherpunk mailing lists in the 90s, one of which would go on to be the list the Bitcoin white paper was published to. The story goes that Craig initially didn't actually out himself as Satoshi, not at first anyway. His first true public association with Bitcoin was a panel with the legendary Nick Sabo, Ed Moy, and a few others, led by the famous author and my good friend Michelle. That footage is still up on YouTube, by the way. I recommend watching it. Anyway, he beams in from a Skype call, and when he is asked how he relates to Bitcoin, he says, That's a lot of certificates. <laughs> 
And how did you first? Economist. How did you first learn about Bitcoin? Um, I've been involved with all this for a long time. I mean, I try and stay. I, I keep my head down, but.、Um, Have you? Were you a miner? A long time ago. A long time ago. Which is about it. He goes on to talk about Bitcoin and its values, why it's important, and so on. But he never actually claims that he is Satoshi. Only a month or so later does a Wired article drop that reveals that they have been receiving leaked emails regarding the true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto, and all signs point to Craig Wright. This marked the start of a multi-year-long fight for Craig to try and prove he was the creator of Bitcoin. A fight that still continues to the present day. But back then, Wright wasn't so keen. Wright was involved in some various Australian businesses, and his home was raided just hours after he was outed as Satoshi by federal police working for the Australian tax authority. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yikes! It seemed that Wright was embroiled in some sort of tax scam perpetrated by his company, De Morgan Limited. I'll be brief on this strange sidetrack, as it may or may not have something to do with the motives behind Wright's claim to being Satoshi. Remember that as of this point in the story, Craig himself has not come out and said that he is Satoshi yet. Really, all we've had are some articles and leaked emails that points to him, but Craig himself has remained silent on the matter. Anywho, the story goes that De Morgan, founded by the big man himself, was working on some sort of supercomputer. According to De Morgan, they spent around 120. Million in Australian funny money for research and development, and the Australian authorities grant tax rebates for this kind of R and D. In this case, to the tune of 45 million Monopoly dollars. Pretty good scam if it is one. And unfortunately for Craig, there really is no data that points to the supercomputer even existing. No evidence has ever been seen. No proof has ever been found. And one really wonders how De Morgan actually managed to fool the Australian government in the first place if they didn't actually have this kind of tech. Ah well. I guess things down under really do work upside down. Moving forward, as time goes on, the plot thickens. Craig ran a company called Hotwire that was apparently funded by Wright's holdings back in 2013. Bitcoins that were equal to around 1.5 percent of the total circulating supply at the time. Quite a lot of Bitcoin for a simple imposter, to be sure. From this point, the story gets jumbled, disconnected, and largely incoherent. What we see begin to form is a portrait of a man who begins to claim more and more boldly that he is in fact Satoshi Nakamoto. And over time, various forms of proof. Do come up like this old blog post here. For those keeping score at home, the date on this one is well before the Bitcoin white paper was published to that cypherpunk newsletter. But as it turns out, you can backdate a lot of things on Blogspot. The magic of post. Then there's Gavin Anderson. Gavin has faded to the background in recent years, but originally he was pretty much the lead dev of Bitcoin, next to Satoshi himself, of course. Satoshi only spoke with a few select individuals through private emails and other correspondence, and Gavin was one such individual. Carrying that amount of clout, one could imagine that Gavin would be careful in what he claims. And one such claim related to Craig Wright specifically, mentioning that he was convinced Wright is Nakamoto after Craig reportedly signed messages with Satoshi's original keys. This sounds pretty damning on paper, but it still doesn't really explain why, if Craig truly had the Satoshi keys, he wouldn't simply sign a public message for the world to see. If Gavin saw Wright sign a message, then Wright could have shown that to the entire chain, forever serving as proof that he is indeed the father of Bitcoin. Well, things in this story aren't so simple. Unfortunately, Wright never did do just that. He made some statements, provided some interesting but inconclusive evidence, and overall made a mess of the whole affair. I don't want money. I don't want fame. I don't want adoration. I just want to be left alone. I'm going to do this once, and once only. I'm going to come in front of the camera once. And I will never, ever be on a camera ever again, for any TV station, or any media, ever. One truly has to wonder why you would go to such lengths to obfuscate the very truth you want out in the open. Unless there is some larger game at play, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. There's other smaller pieces of evidence too, like an analysis on Wright's sleeping habits compared to Satoshi's activity. Wright, as an Australian, isn't active for eight to ten hours of the day. But going by Satoshi's posts on the Bitcoin Talk forums, on the other hand, we see a picture of an individual who is much more likely British, judging by the things like his computer format and the Genesis block quoting a UK newspaper on the day Bitcoin was launched. 
Of course, none of that is really conclusive evidence either. Particularly smart individuals like Satoshi and yes, Craig Wright are certainly capable of manipulating something like a perceived schedule. Hell, I've considered doing it myself to hide my Twitter posts. And I'm nowhere near as important and I'm nowhere near as smart. So people who think that this isn't something one could fake is definitely not giving it much consideration. Perhaps the most interesting piece of information regarding this entire case is known as the Tulip Trust. I will spare the obvious puns here, but I'll give you a quick gestalt. The Tulip Trust is purported a collection of Bitcoin that Craig Wright mined between the dates of 2009 and 2011. It contains over 1 million Bitcoin, an amount that is eerily similar to the amount estimated to be in the Satoshi wallets. The members of the trust include Dave Kleiman, a computer forensics expert who died in 2013, Craig Wright, and Satoshi Nakamoto. Apparently you get two votes when it comes to your own creation. Anyway, the Bitcoin in the trust is going to be unlocked for Craig Wright on January 1st, 2020. So, in just a few months, we may actually know if this trust was legitimate or not. Until then, hard to say if this is true or just more hot air. But I think you are starting to see a pattern emerge here. From PGP keys that are backdated to signatures that were never associated with Satoshi himself, a massive web of shoddy proof begins to form. Ultimately, there's not even one piece of evidence that can be pointed to that doesn't have some sort of caveat or require some theory crafting and creative imagination on the part of the person analyzing it. Craig Wright is enigmatic. He's clearly an intelligent man, likely several standard deviations above the norm. He has been involved in Bitcoin since the earliest days of its history, and he does make the best case out of anyone for his claim to the title of Satoshi. Craig is a man who, despite whatever many may believe, is more than just a simpleton or a fool. No. Craig is a calculated genius, ever eager to turn his attention towards ever more profitable ventures. Is he truly Satoshi Nakamoto? Well, the jury's still out on that one. One can only ever speculate and dissect the evidence, coming to their own conclusion regarding the Australian scholar. One should always look for a motive whenever possible in these kind of things. Does it make sense for Craig Wright to be claiming himself as Nakamoto? Certainly there's a lot of fame involved. Could that be what he's after? Or is it somehow related to his companies under audit? And we are tracing out the story of a man looking for an excuse, any excuse, to prove to the authorities that he truly has been working on something with all those millions he was funded with. And would it make sense for the real Satoshi to come out of hiding, endangering the very network he came to create? It's definitely a risk to have one of Bitcoin's largest holders out and about, with the ability to tank the market at will. One thing is for certain. With the events of forks like Bitcoin Satoshi's vision spearheaded by Craig, it has almost certainly been a profit venture for him. In American justice, there is a concept called reasonable doubt. If you can prove a crime was committed beyond a reasonable doubt, then you can dole out a guilty verdict. The question for the viewer is simple. Do you have a reasonable doubt that Craig is Satoshi Nakamoto? That's a question only you can answer. Where the lines between truth and fantasy exist are blurred when it comes to the case of Satoshi Nakamoto. And as Craig Wright says, it's all too easy to make up myths. Thanks for watching this video, took a hell of a lot of work and due process in researching the relevant facts. Not to mention going through all of the misinformation, trying to piece all of this together was a lot more intensive than I thought it would be. There are a few things I didn't cover, like Calvin Ayer's involvement in the whole endchain business, but I don't think much of that has to do with Craig Wright's claims as Satoshi. Nonetheless, I hope you got something from this video, and I certainly hope you have a better idea on Craig Wright as an individual. The more the community knows after all, the better. If you like this video, please give it a like, and make sure to subscribe. If this video gets some traction, I'll probably do more of them, so make sure to show your support. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, my tag is at PhilBeforeShill. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.